excited to do this. He's been in the NBA now a decade and uh, big college numbers as well. Creighton's Doug McDermott as you get ready for the weekend. What's up, man? Good to see you. You too, Ryan. Uh, it's, it's good to be on. You know, obviously, uh, really excited for this weekend with Creighton playing. You know, uh, I should be saying that I'm really excited to play the Lakers tomorrow, but obviously I got Creighton on my mind at 10-15. Uh, thankfully, we play at 7-15, so I'll be able to, to do both. So how often do you just watch the games and then immediately talk to your dad after? I mean, I imagine that's that's a pretty often occurrence, but like, how does that conversation work? I mean, I, I'm locked in at all times. You know, even if we're playing, I got a ball boy. I got a trainer on the on the bench, you know, checking the scores. And, you know, I'm, I'm really invested in creating basketball, um, just constantly getting updates. Even I'll ask people in the crowd sometimes, sitting courtside, hey, you got your phone on you? Can you uh, check the Creighton UConn score? Uh, so th- it's always a it's always a stressful time. Uh, but uh I try not to talk to my dad too much right after games, uh, his games especially. He'll definitely hit me with some good texts after some of my games, just the coach and him and the dad and him. But I try not to go there with him um, after his games. I let him kind of decompress, and then we'll talk about you know the coming days. So you won't be like, hey, how come you guys did this? You'd never do that with him. I don't really question him. Uh, he, he's a lot smarter than I am. Uh, <laughs> I've learned a lot uh, from him, uh, but I try not to give too much advice. Uh, sometimes I'll give him shit, you know, if he didn't foul, you know, up three, you know, sometimes he's stubborn with that, but, uh, you know, he, he's, he's stuck in his own ways with, with that stuff. Do you notice stuff and we realize the games are, are different, but you know, the way you saw the game when you're there lighting it up and then you get this many years in the NBA and then you think about your preparation and the things that you're looking for, like, do you, do you notice something and be like, I can't even. I can't even tell him that, or I can't even point that out because it's just, it's just so different. It's pointless. It's just so different. Yeah. Like you said, being in the NBA 10 years, just the different rules um, that there are, you know, obviously the defense at three in college is like something I didn't even really think about until like I got in the NBA. I mean, just so much more space to play with uh, in the NBA, um, just the rules. I mean, not being able to advance the ball at the end of games, you know, in college, you know, I think uh, you see, uh, you know, you can, you don't really have a, a, a end of game play because you can't advance the ball. I think if you saw the NCAA change that, where you can call a timeout, um, you'd see a lot more buzzer beaters, a lot more strategic strategic plays um, towards the end of games, and uh, that's something I wish college had. Um, just some different rules here and there that the NBA has, um, and that, that I mean, I think it'd make it a lot more exciting uh, to watch. But you know, it is what it is. You know, you see the Leitner play. Uh, you know the Grant Hill Leitner play, they show it over and over again because you just don't see a lot of plays like that in college. Um, so that's something that I think would be awesome. Yeah, I agree with that big time because I just think like, hey, it makes it more fun when the ball's advanced and then you have a side out of bounds and you're you're on your side of the court. Like it just gives you a better chance. It's a bit like the college football rule where the clock stops on the first down. Um, I just I just like stuff that that makes the end a little bit more exciting because I think with all the reviews that we have at both levels, you know, we miss the moments. Like there's very little back and forth for three possessions late in a close game. And that drama is supposed to build and you're supposed to have that kind of moment where you're like, you're not sure what's going to happen. It's just, it's just hard, I think, to ask the players and, and even the crowd where it's like, okay, you just chill out for five minutes while you're confused and now come back because the game's tied and be just as excited as you were. I think it's really, it's one of my favorite things. It's like, let's make everything Let's fix everything by making it worse. For sure. And, you know, I think if you're down three in college and there's like four or five seconds left and you don't have a timeout, I mean, you just you assume the game's over because, I mean, rarely are you going to make that full court pass. Someone's probably going to foul. You know, in college, you can take a timeout, drop the play, um, and, and have a good set. And, uh, you know, I think another thing is that's huge in the NBA is the six fouls compared to the five in college um, because so many times in college you'll see – a star player get two fouls, you know, in the first eight minutes of the game and they're sitting the whole half um, and it just ruins the game, you know, at times, you know, in the, in the NBA, you get six, I think an extra foul, obviously it's a huge difference. And, you know, a lot of times refs aren't calling fouls on, you know, Jokic or Embiid or MVP type player. Um, Cause they kind of know that this is for, you know, there's some ratings here, you know, obviously we want to watch the best players. And sometimes in college, 
uh, the best player goes out and it's like, why have I been watching this? You know, this, this, I'm not going to see him the whole half. Yeah. That was like that Georgetown, Ohio state final four. And I was like, Oh, great. Everybody has fouls. Awesome. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go back to the start of your stuff. Cause you've played for a bunch of really great coaches. Was it tougher to play for your father in college or Tibbs as a rookie? Tibbs, <laughs> Tibbs, <laughs> Tibbs by far. Uh, you know, the thing with Tibbs, uh, you know, I obviously love the guy. I mean, it was, it was a tough year for me not playing and whatnot. Um, I, I honestly don't know if he knew my name. I think a few times he called me Kyle. I thought it was Kyle Corver, uh, <laughs> from the year prior. Uh, so I always told Kyle that and he's like, man, I don't think he knew my name either. And I played for him for three years. Uh, but I mean, just the way he, he, uh, looking back, it was the best thing that happened to me. You know, he just taught me how to be a pro, um, always there early, there late, just being a good teammate. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever been late for a bus in the NBA cause I was so scared of walking on the bus and, you know, Tibbs looking at me. Uh, so I think that kind of stuff prepared me so much. Uh, you know, I, there was one, t- one time where, uh, I was out on the court warming up like three hours before the game and, uh, Tibbs called me into his office. He had his video guy come get me. And I was like, man, I finally might have cracked the rotation here. I might have a conversation with Tibbs here. And he gives me the classic, come on, man. I'm like, what, what did I do? And uh, I guess my phone was on loud in the locker room as he was drawing up like the, the plays and the strategy for that night. And uh, he's like, you got to have your phone on silent, man. And I think that's the last time I talked to him that season. <laughs> Did, was he with, was he like that with everybody? Uh, I mean, a little bit, you know, obviously Joe Kim and Derek and Taj and, you know, Kirk Heinrich, the more veteran guys, uh, you know, obviously had a, a better, you know, feel for him, but as a rookie, I mean, I think it's part of his deal. It just, you got, you kind of got to fear him. And I, I think I've told him this before, you know, I, I've been on a lot of teams whenever I see Tibbs, I always try and thank him because uh, I, I just think he was a huge part of, you know, getting me to where I am today. You know, I, I just, he, he built so many good habits for me at, at a young age and it sucked at the time. You know, I hated it. I was miserable. Uh, but looking back, I mean, everything else has been kind of easy since. You know, Joe is one of my favorite players because I couldn't stand him at Florida and I don't really know why. I mean, I, I guess it was a really good team. I think it's because I liked Horford so much more. And there was that stretch where people were like, oh, if Noah comes out, he's going to be the number one pick. And I was like, no way. I was like, he's not that kind of guy. And then he got to the league, and then I loved him. He became one of my favorite guys. And I think about, like, the personality that you have. And as you're telling tip stories, like with Noah, I could just see Noah being impervious to that, just being like, you can be as mean as you want to be, but, like, I'm just going to have the best time. And then – you know, sometimes I think about you, and this is like a bigger thing, but when your dad is such a big part of your life and you're, you're more likely your personality is going to be like, I'm going to defer to him a bit. Like it would probably blow your mind to see somebody in that power dynamic to be like, wait, you're, you're, you're not going to listen to your coach. And I don't even know what Noah was necessarily like. I just think I know his personality well enough that he just wasn't going to let that stuff bother him no matter what. Also because he was really good and played his ass off. Yeah, I think you're spot on with Joe. Uh, you know, obviously, here I am coming from playing for my dad, you know, kind of being a yes man, trying to impress all the NBA coaches. And then, you know, my first day on training camp, you know, doing closeout drills. And I see Joe Keem, you know, just sitting there kind of like skipping the drills. Like, I don't need this shit. I'll be ready for the games, you know. And Tibbs would just kind of laugh it off, you know, because, you know, they had been together for so long. You know, they'd already been together for like four or five, six years. And, uh, you know, it, it was crazy. You know, their relationship was awesome. You know, I think, um, obviously there were some practices where those guys weren't wanting to do stuff, but once that ball's tipped, um, and at the United center, you know, they're ready to go, go to war for that guy. And, uh, you know, it was pretty, pretty cool to be a part of that. Yeah. I could see a coach being like, as long as I get the Noah, we get in a game for 30 plus minutes, then I'm not worried about it. Cause that guy played hard. Uh, and that's what, would end up being the thing with me where I was like, everybody should want this guy on the team. So if we love, uh, excuse me, if we run through the coaches that you've had, it's Tibbs, uh, it's Hoiberg, Billy Donovan with OKC, you had Hornacek, Carlisle, Nate McMillan, uh, Nate Bjorkren, Pop, and then Carlisle again. Now they're back with the pace. I think the easy answer that maybe you give us in the post game is like, hey, all these guys are prepared and everybody's the same. Um, but 
what's actually different? Like, oh, wow, we prepared this way with this guy, or this was a priority, this wasn't. And I'm not here necessarily to, to have you be negative about any of them. I want to just learn more about it from you and that you've played for some major names <laughs> in the NBA. I want to know what, what was different about different stops for you. Yeah, I mean, do we have all day? Uh, <laughs> as long uh, as you want, man. It's great. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've played for so many guys, like you said. And, uh, you know, obviously, I feel like the number one thing uh, is accountability. And, you know, the guys like Pop, guys like Rick, they can hold guys accountable because they've won titles. You know, they've had Tim Duncan, they've had Dirk, um, and those guys have respected them um, for them to be able to do their job. You know, and I've played for some other guys, you know, some really smart guys that just don't have that pedigree, that championship pedigree. It doesn't take anything away from, you know, how smart they are X and O's wise. You know, those are some of the smartest guys I've played for. Um, you know, but if you don't have that um, background, uh, it's hard to hold star players accountable. You know, I think that's the great thing about Pop and Rick. Um, they're going to treat, you know, Tyrese and Pascal and Wemby the same way they're going to treat me or TJ McConnell. Um, and I, I just, I think that's the biggest difference in the NBA is being able to hold the whole rock locker room accountable. Um, because if you're just picking on certain guys and, and not the star players, um, you know, guys can see right through that stuff. And I, I think, uh, that's the, that's the big thing in NBA coaching is just being able to hold the whole locker room accountable. And I'm not saying bad about any of those guys I've played for, cause they're all great coaches, but, um, it's, it's a huge difference, um, when you have that and, uh, it just gets guys to come together and, and play together, you know, every night. I talked to Austin Rivers about this last season, and it was incredibly revealing in that, you know, I'm always kind of interested in, in that that realization, right, once you're in the league. And here's Rivers. He's a lottery pick. Comes back after his first year. He's thinking like, all right, I'm going to start making all-star games, you know, and especially with him because he'd had this massive profile in high school and then at Duke. And then he's, you know, he told me, he's like, and then I'm, what? I'm like, I'm coming off the bench. You know, you're a lottery pick, huge numbers of Creighton. And then you kind of have to find your role. What was that like for you personally? It was tough, man. Um, I'm not going to lie. You know, I, I think being in Chicago too, you know, being a lottery pick, you know, I have all these expectations, you know, the fans are expecting so much great things and it doesn't go the, the way you want it to right off the bat. And, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, I struggled with early. Um, but, you know, the quicker you realize, um, you know, I'm not the best player on the floor anymore. And, you know, my my dad's not drawing up 15 ice was a game for me. Uh, the quicker you get over yourself in the NBA, um, the better career you're going to have. You know, I think uh, I, I just kind of I think Fred Hoiberg was great for me. He came in that second year. You know, he just kind of let me play freely. Um, you know, it's not like I was an all star or anything, but I showed that I could be a role player in the NBA and that I could find my niche. I think that's the the number one thing is if you're not one or two guys on the team, if you're not an all-star, you got to find something that, you know, separates yourself from the rest of the league. And, and for me, I feel like it's moving without the basketball and, sh and shooting threes and just trying to put pressure on the defense. Um, I'm not going to get any ISOs. I'm not going to get any alley-oops drawn up for me. Uh, I'm going to be in the corner. I'm going to be slipping out of ball screens. Uh, I'm going to be a, the best team defender I can be. Um, and the quick, the quicker I realize that instead of, complaining about shots or, you know, playing time, uh, just saying less and, and doing more with, with my play out there. Um, if I'm going to, even if I have zero points and I feel like I affected the game by, you know, slipping out of a ball screen for Tyrese or TJ or, you know, who knows? Um, I feel like I did my job. And I think the, the, the whole NBA sees that, you know, they can tell when guys are selfish and they can tell when guys are unselfish. And I think, uh, that's something that I try to hang my hat on. Yeah, I felt bad for you because, you know, in the beginning, it's like, man, you know, they made the move for you. They take you. We'd all seen you in school. And then, you know, Tibbs is not, it was, it was too good of a team to be like, all right, here, here are your 16 shots and you're playing 35 minutes. And, and because we took you, we're going to invest all these possessions in you, right? I mean, that's what yeah. happens with a lot of guys on lesser teams. And so when that happens, the unfortunate part, because, yeah, I mean, that team, your rookie year won 50 games. The unfortunate part is, and I'm even guilty of this at times, is you're kind of like the first couple of years, you go, ah, oh, all right. And then 
it's almost like we have to be reintroduced to your evolution as a player because then you're like, wait, that guy still like makes all of his shots. <laughs> like, wait, the, there is now something here. When you look at your shooting splits and then you go, OK, he's trying here. He knows where to be in position all the time. Like there has to be a spot for him somewhere and kind of reassessing like our own expectations, which obviously probably at times for you were really tough. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, and I, and I bounced around a little bit early in my career, as you said, you know, I played for a lot of teams and, you know, it took me a while to figure that out. And, uh, I, I owe honestly a lot to Rick Carlisle, who I play for now, um, back in Indy. Um, I think Dallas was like my third or fourth stop in the NBA. Um, I'd been tossed around a little bit and, I kind of looked at that. It was just right after the all-star break. I kind of looked at that. This could be potentially my last chance. You know, I, I got to go out there and play freely. I got to just kind of say F it and, and shoot it and just, and just play like myself. And Rick gave me a great opportunity. We didn't win many games. Um, it was that Luca draft year. So, you know, there's probably some incentive there to down the stretch, not to win a ton. Uh, and I just went out there and played. I, I played free. I shot like 45 or 50% after the uh, break that year. Ended up getting a great deal with Indiana. Um, and I mean, the rest is kind of, that's kind of what um, helped me stay in this league. Um, what was that little stretch there? So I always try to remind, remind Rick, like how thankful I was for him. And, um, you know, obviously everything worked out for the Mavs. They got Luca that summer. I'm actually two for two uh, on superstars. I got Luca in Dallas and then Wemby in San Antonio. So I guess I'm just kind of, I'm the good luck charm if teams are looking for that. So like I had a Cooper flag next year, some team's going to pick you up and be like, Doug, here's the deal. You're our first option for six straight months. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm the, I'm the go-to guy. <laughs> yeah. I looked it up. You were 50% for, for, for Dallas from three, you know, I know yeah. it was, it was, it was less than half the season, but all right. So you get to San Antonio and you know, we're, I, I think I've asked, I don't know how many different Spurs guys, like different pop questions. What's personal to you about playing for pop? What's something no one else is going to tell me? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've heard all the stories about the team dinners and the wine and just the culture. Um, just unbelievable guy to play for. I remember, uh, my first exit meeting with him, I was so nervous. I mean, I played for him for a year and, you know, everyone's like, Pop's like, make sure you see me before you guys leave. And um, I was just kind of waiting around. I'm like, when is it my turn? He's talking to all the young guys. And he uh, he just comes up to me in the weight room. He's like, I don't need to talk to you. I said, all right, perfect. He said, you might be the, one of the worst defenders I've ever coached, but you can really shoot that thing. He's like, you're, you're not as bad as Kerr defensively, but I'll, I'll, I'll see you next September. Like, <laughs> that that was uh, just a story. Uh, from pop that's just telling who he is he's gonna call it how he sees it um he's gonna hold everyone accountable kind of as i was talking about earlier you know he treats wemby you know as tough as anyone um in the locker room you know he'll, he'll be calling him out first clip on film you know saying we're not shooting the shot you know it's just he's just a very authentic guy very real genuine guy um and just really enjoyed my two and a half three years with him he he taught me a lot when someone says you're a bad defender what do you do? Maybe is it, is you're like, all right, all summer ladder work. Like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Like, I know that's been the knock on you. You're clearly aware of it. So do you just get to a point of like, Hey, I'm just not going to be good enough against certain guys in the NBA. And I, I have to figure out how to at least just be in the right spot. I, I just, I wonder what that's like when people keep saying it about you. I mean, it is what it is. You know, I, I kind of, I know the deal. I know what I'm out there for. Um, I'm definitely not out there to be a, you know, defensive stopper. Um, but, you know, there's there's things you can do. I mean, just putting in some effort. I mean, just communicating with your teammates, you know, trying to, you know, I, f I feel like you, as a guy like me, you're going to get picked on. They're going to call you up into ball screens, but you got to be the best show defender. You know, instead of switching, you got to find a way to make an impact on if you're going to show or um, just communicate, communicating a different way to your teammate. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in the summertime, I'm working on it. I'm working on closeouts. I'm working on ladder drill but you know at the end of the day you know i know who i am i know what i'm out there for i'm out there to make shots and make an impact on the game that way but i think uh guys like corver and um you know i'm not just trying to say all these six seven white guys but you know dunleavy uh they became really good defenders later in their career uh because you know they were able to you know take charges always be in the right spot and that's something i'm always looking at you know trying to trying to become a better defender 
Yeah, I mean, if you had thrown Sam Hauser in there, we'd be like, hey, look yeah, out. Duncan Sam, gets, <laughs> yeah. Sam gets switched into all the time, and it's always funny, especially like when he was just starting to play this year. And I was like, he actually holds up way better. And then like guys will switch to him twice, like two possessions in a row. They're kind of like, wait, what's what's going on here? <laughs> like, this is bad. Yeah, Sam's, How Sam's, you- <laughs> Sam's a sneaky good defender. He got he's got that Tony Bennett, um, Virginia. Um, background so he, he he knows how to hold his own okay your first impression your first time meeting Wemby being on the floor with him what was it like when you got him into camp um I mean he's I mean it's just it's insane how tall he is you know I think uh when you see him in person you're like what the hell like this guy's a legit a foot taller than me um but I remember we were doing like a we're doing like a yoga session you know typical spurs we're doing a, a yoga session on an off day um, we're all laying down there. Um, and Vic gets up of all people and he's like, does anyone need a towel or a water or, or an extra mat or anything? And I'm like, what the hell this kid, you know, th- I, I think that was just a sign to show you. Like, I mean, he is, he truly just want, wants to be one of the guys. He wants to be treated the same. Um, you don't see that a lot from rookies, you know, let alone number one picks. Um, you know, I, I think I was giving some shit to our rookies from the previous year. I'm like, wow, this guy's willing to do this. So where was this from any of you guys last year? You know, it's uh, he just, uh, he's a special guy. He's super humble. He, um, he just constantly reading books on the plane, just very low key. And I think he's a perfect fit for San Antonio just because that's how Tim was. Um, very low maintenance, um, didn't want the spotlight and uh, just, just a joy to be around him every day. It's incredible how lucky San Antonio is that you get Duncan where I think there's some Curry similarities there where it's like, okay, if the face of the franchise is, is wired this way, then it just changes everything. Like you can search for it. You can hope to draft it. But you're basically asking like, okay, which Hall of Famer can I draft that has the perfect personality to be at the center of this, but to make everybody else feel valued, right? It's right. just, it's really hard, especially because even though basketball is a team sport, like we both know there, there's a lot of individualism in it. And to think that the Spurs would get this two-decade run with Duncan, and hell, you can even go further back with, with David Robinson, but then to have one Banyama where, you know, I could watch all the videos, and I don't never talk to him, but when I watch him play, I go, There's, there may be a lot of that in there with him, where it's like, yeah, no, I know what I'm being asked to do, and I know the responsibility of it, but I'm, I'm going to do it in a way where I want all of this to work and I want to care about all these things that are the right things to care about. And it just seems like, you know, beyond the physical stuff, and the athleticism, it's like, wait, they really get the perfect person to lead the next, however many years he's there. It really did. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like the Tim comparisons, obviously. And then him being from France, you know, Tony being in town all the time, Manu's pretty much at the facility every single day. I mean, these guys are, really around him all the time to help him, you know, kind of guide him through his career. And I think that's huge. And just, I mean, just the way he plays, I mean, it's just so exciting. Um, I mean, all you have to do is throw it somewhere around the rim and he's going to get it. And uh, he's just, he's an unselfish guy. I think just, I think the sky's the limit. Obviously he hasn't even really figured out how to get fouled. You know, I think once he learns to, to draw fouls, I mean, it's even going to take his game to the next level. Um, Not that we like, watching free throws all night but i just think it's something that he's gonna he's gonna be able to get calls and with his length and swiping through defenders um i think it's just gonna add a whole different dimension to his game is there a moment this season where when you were playing with him you felt like somebody really tried to challenge him try to beat him up a little bit just kind of want to see what he was made of and it's something you remember honestly um it, it felt I felt like the Chet thing is real. You know, the rivalry bet- between them, I feel like they they really take it personal. I think Wemby really wanted to play well in those games. Um, you know, there was a couple guys, I think like Andre Drummond or someone tried to get on, you know, under his skin a little bit. And he he like accepts that. He's like, he's the opposite of soft. You know, he's 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 a tough guy. He wants he wants that physicality. He wants that that talking and I think that's the difference between him and him and a lot of guys in his position is he he welcomes that. He really does. And uh I, I think he he's really gonna continue to to welcome that and he's he's gonna he's gonna get it every night because he's gonna get everyone's best shot. And uh you know, there's only so much he can do with a with a seven six guy. You can't he's just gonna 
reach over you and, and dunk it. So you make your way back to the Pacers, Carlisle again, which we've alluded to a bunch of times. Have you ever during your NBA career been able to say like, hey, if you guys are thinking about moving me, but like, I'm wondering if there was ever a transaction where you had a moment of influence. Uh, I mean, free agency a little bit. Um, well, sure. But free agency, obviously. Uh, uh, but, you know, this year, obviously, um, being on the Spurs, you know, we weren't winning a ton. Um, I knew being on an expiring deal, you know, there'd be an opportunity uh, probably for me to get traded. And that's that's exactly how it worked out. You know, I think there was a few calls, you know, obviously on trade deadline day. and. Uh, you know, I, I obviously felt very strong about Indiana and I know their interest. And it was one of those deals where they just made it happen. And uh, I was I was super excited to be back. Um, obviously, really loved my time in San Antonio. I still talk to those guys all the time. Um, but being on a more veteran team uh, like the Pacers uh, back with, you know, Miles, TJ, um, Tyrese, obviously unbelievable player and Pascal. But um I knew, I knew there was a, a high chance I could get traded, and that's exactly what happened. And I'm, I'm glad it's back to a place I'm familiar with. Playing with Halliburton, I imagine that, you know, look, there's great passers in the league, but my favorite thing is the way he sees the game, how he keeps everybody in the possession alive. Like, do you have to remind yourself, or did you have to maybe the first few games back when your minutes were aligned where it's like he'll, he'll still find me even when I think may think I'm out of the play. Like, what is that like playing next to him? It's, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, the thing about Tyrese is, uh, with a lot of guys, um, you know, superstars, all stars, you know, they make the assist for the assist. You know, Tyrese is a guy where he doesn't care about the, the hockey assist. Like he doesn't, he's fine making the hockey assist, the pass to a pass, um, which is the best part about him. Like you, you feel like he, he makes the right read every time, you know, and, if I'm open in the corner, but Miles Turner's rolling to the rim, he'll hit Miles first, and Miles could swing it to the corner. Like he, he truly just wants to win. He, he's he's a he's a very smart guy, um, and I've I've never seen anyone make a pick and roll look so easy. You know, he just makes the right right read every time. And I was obviously with his ability to shoot the three, it just opens everything else up for the rest of us. 